Okay, so let's start the uh, new school, the new meeting with uh, with Julien Ploton, uh, coming from uh, EGC Lab, so a laboratory in, uh, near from Paris. So we will talk to this uh, this morning about um, uh, about um, big data and uh, and Spark Apache Spark. So how to deal with many data and uh, process them uh, in a fine way. So please, uh, Julien, uh, when you're ready, you can start. Thank you, Frédéric. Thank you. Uh, so thanks for attending. So today, yes, we'll focus on big data processing, and especially we'll uh, dig a bit uh, the Apache Spark framework. Um, so to start briefly, who am I? Uh, so my name is Julien. So I've done a PhD in cosmology uh, at APC in France. And since 2018, uh, I am a research software engineer at AJC Lab. So my main technical activities are focused on big data processing and file computing in general. And I do also a lot of cloud, cloud computing. And on the science aspect, uh, I'm working on the Robin Observatory. So it was previously named LSST. And I'm focusing on the transient sky. Uh, so everything that moves on the sky. Uh, and multi-messenger astronomy. And I still do a little bit of cosmic microwave background. Okay, so enough speaking of me. Today, uh, the focus is on Spark. Um, so before we start, so all the material, uh, including those slides, can be found in the GitHub repository of the school. Uh, so let me just quickly jump on that one. So this is the school. Uh, if you haven't done do a git pool, you will have all the, all the latest uh, inclusion. Uh, inclusion. Uh, and here you have a folder called Spark. So if you click on it and you browse, you will have a readme with everything explained, including the detail of those sessions, uh, what you need before the lecture, although it's too late, the lecture started. Um, how to play the exercise. So we provide uh, in, uh, here in the, in the directory a number of scripts that just help you, uh, well, interacting with Docker. So we'll, I, I will primarily use Docker. Uh, you don't have to, but that will ease your life, definitely. For Unix users, so Linux or um, uh, Mac, you can use the .sh uh, runners. And for Windows, thanks to Guillaume, thank you very much, uh, you can use the .bat. So you can just execute those scripts and they will, for example, build the, the Docker image for you. Uh, and they, they will also help you to um, open the notebooks. Um, so it's very easy. So let me just quickly uh, go back to that one. Uh, and for those who don't want to use Docker or cannot just use Docker, uh, you can also run the notebooks on Google Colab. Uh, so Colab is just a uh, online service uh, that uh, allows you to play, to run notebook directly uh, using the Google uh, the Google Cloud. Uh, so you can click on that. Oops, it's probably too small. You can click on, on uh, that link here, and it will open uh, a new window where you can choose basically. Let me do it. Oh, and it will open this one. So you have to be connected with your Google account. And here you have a list, the list of all the notebooks that are detected in the school uh, repository. So there are many, many different notebooks. And if you scroll down, you will find the Spark notebooks. And you can click on that. It will open uh, the notebook, and you can directly interact with the lecture. Um, so, so of course, all the things you are seeing, so those are notebooks. Let me just start again. Uh, this is a notebook that I will describe during the lecture. And you can, and they can be played as slide. And so for that, if you open the notebook, you can just click on this uh, icon here, and it will show the slide for you. OK, so you know everything about using the material. So now let's talk about the content. So the main goal of this lecture is to get familiar with Apache Spark. So I know, I think most of you, uh, based on the, on the poll at the very beginning of the school, are beginners uh, for, for Spark, for in using Spark. So I will start with a very long introduction 
describing what is Spark, uh, why we should use it, and why we shouldn't use it sometimes. Um, in particular, we'll focus on the Python API. So Spark is a framework, so there are many, many different things. We won't cover everything today. Uh, okay, that, would, that would have been nice, but uh, we won't have time in three hours. So we'll focus on, on the Python API called PySpark. And of course, we'll focus on the scientific context, so how you can use it uh, in for your research. Um, so yes, very long introduction. Then we'll uh, introduce a few functionalities of interest. And of course, as time goes by, uh, we'll uh, complexify a bit more things and, and see real life cases, and how you can use Spark in real life cases. Okay, so Spark. So in order, in, in order to understand Spark, you have to go back uh, a little bit uh, in time. Um, I would say um, it all started in 2004 when Google basically published a paper uh, to describe the MapReduce programming model. So at that time, uh, of course, Google was driven by the need to process huge amount of data in a very short amount of time. So anytime you were, you were writing something on the search series, for example, you wanted your, the answer uh, in a matter of, of uh, second or even less. So they have this huge volume of data and, and they had to find a way uh, to give answer uh, very quickly. So this paper uh, is very interesting, very good. It, it described really the MapReduce funding model in detail, but unfortunately, uh, the implementation uh, at that time was proprietary. So of course, Google uh, as a company uh, needed to make money. So we had to wait 2006 to have a very good implementation, uh, open source implementation by Hadoop. So Hadoop is a huge framework still existing uh, with many different tools and, uh, and inside uh, they had the implementation, very efficient implementation of, of um, the MapReduce programming model. Um, but both Google MapReduce and Hadoop uh, MapReduce, they had limitations. Um, in 2009, started a research project and that was a research project at the beginning uh, at Berkeley, University of California. Uh, that try basically to address uh, the limitation of, of Hadoop and, and Google MapReduce. And this project basically uh, gave rise to Spark. So in between 2000, 2009 and 2014, uh, well, it was the very beginning Spark uh, started was probably not very well known. And in 2014, the, the first version of Spark, the first stable version was released. Uh, it was already uh, widely used uh, in the industry. We had the version two in 2016 and the version three basically last year, 2020, and now we are version 3.1, 3.2. So Spark is a cluster computing framework. Uh, namely, it's a set of tools to perform computation on a network of many machines. This is it. Um, so when, when you should use Apache Spark, so when Apache Spark is used, rule of thumb, um, probably the first and then the, the principal one is when you have a lot of data. And when, when I mean a lot of data is really capital lot. Uh, the idea is to do big data processing, not megabyte or gigabyte processing. It's, it's really uh, for hundreds of, giga, uh, of gigabytes or terabytes or, and complex or very naively structured, but you need to have a lot of data. Otherwise, there are probably better suited, suited tools to do that. And data can be static in the sense that it's already stored on some disk, or uh, that can be streaming data, so coming as flux. So Spark is very good when you need to perform iterative analysis over a large data set. So if I go back to my timeline, at the very beginning, uh, both for Google MapReduce or Hadoop, the idea is of MapReduce is you would load the data uh, on the memory of many machines. Then you would do a map phase. So you would do something with the data. So I don't know, compute, uh, transform the data, compute some, uh, some byproduct, I don't know, whatever. But you do, you do it only once. So there is only one map phase. And then you would reduce the result to the driver. So you, you wouldn't be able to hold the data in the memory of machines to do subsequent steps. 
So that was a huge limitation because, of course, if you have a lot of data, you are higher bound. So the, the, the problem is really moving the data from one place to another. So each time you had to load the data, do something, write the data, then load the data, et cetera, et cetera. So that was not very efficient if you have to do many things with the same data set. And one of the strengths of Spark is to overcome this by giving the possibility to hold data in cache of different machines of your network and perform many uh, iteration over this data. So that, so of course, that sped up a lot <laughs> the computation. And uh, at, the, at the time of the benchmark, Spark by, was basically beating everything by a factor of 100, thanks to this capability. So that's the first thing uh, you need to consider with Spark. The second thing is when you want to perform interactive data analysis over a large data set. So Spark is very good for data mining. So you have a lot of data. You don't know this data. So you want to search a bit. Of course, if you have one terabyte and, and you are using your local machine, you'll probably wait a very long time just searching in the data randomly. With Spark, you have uh, a lot of tools to do that very efficiently. So why would you use uh, Apache Spark? Uh, over other technology, for example. So first of all, uh, well, it's a bit of marketing things, but it proved uh, right in, uh, in the practice. Uh, it's a unified analytics engine in the sense that you can both uh, manipulate static data, streaming data, graph data, machine learning, blah, 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 all those things uh, in Spark with the same API, basically. You don't need to change things. Uh, the, the, the syntax is the same. And that helps you, and that uh, is very efficient on a daily basis, because once you need the syntax and the structure, you can apply it, you can apply it in many different contexts. So that's very good. Second thing, it's open source. Uh, so it belongs to the Apache Foundation, uh, hence the name. Um, and there is a large and active community of developers and users. And when I say large, it's, it's like more than 1,000 uh, individual developers contributed to Spark. And it's used by literally more than 1,000 companies over the world. So it's very active. And you can find all the, all the source code uh, hosted on GitHub. So what are the main features of Spark? Uh, more in detail. So first of all, Spark uh, is based on implicit data parallelism. So for those of you who already do parallel computation, it's not trivial uh, to basically distribute the data, the computation, because network can be very complicated. So you have those many machines. Uh, sometimes you don't know where is the data. And you don't know how to split the data. And, one day, and your code can work on one data, data set but cannot work on a second data set because the structure is slightly different. And so you have to rewrite your program. Uh, so it, it's a pain usually. In Spark, it's very different. Uh, so they have a very different approach by saying, uh, basically the bottleneck in uh, parallel computing is the user, is the programmer. So the programmer is really new at guessing how things should be done. So let's do the machine uh, does that for you. For, for you. So in Spark, you don't have to worry about where the data is, how should I move my data. Everything will be done under the hood for you. You can tweak it, of course, for, for performance. But in most of the case, you will see it's just a matter of writing one single line. And this single line will work in many different contexts. Um, based on that, uh, Spark is really very easily scalable from laptop to entire clusters. So you can test things on your laptop. So you write a program. And in most of the case, 99.9%, uh, this program will be also usable as is in an entire cluster of machines. You don't have to write anything else to make it work in a different context. So that's good because you can move, uh, you can do the fast development on your laptop and then move in production basically in a matter of seconds or minutes. Uh, so Spark implement full tolerance. So that was inherited from Hadoop and, and the Google MapReduce implementation. So one thing is when you are working with a network of machines, uh, machines first can be heterogeneous. 
So you can have uh, super top good machines and you can have, uh, well, very old machines. So some machines can be, well, can, can be killed or you can have uh, out of memory uh, errors. You can have many different problems in your network. And of course, when you launch a job, you don't want that the job uh, be killed just because one machine in the network uh, has a problem. So you, you want the, 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 the framework basically to deal with that and to say, well, if a machine fail, basically, just remove this machine, uh, take another machine if there is uh, one available and continue running. And this is the idea of fault tolerance. Of course, it has limitation, cannot do all the magic you would like to do. Uh, but in for, let's say, daily problem, machine, machine failure, out of memory, it's very efficient and you don't have to worry about anything. The last feature, uh, which I think is, is quite great, is so Spark can be seen as a domain-specific language uh, on Scala. So Scala is, is a language uh, mostly uh, well oriented uh, uh, toward functional programming. So let me yeah. Um, so Scala is, is uh, well, in general, it's a general purpose uh, programming language, uh, quite young, starting in 2004. So if you compare that to C++ or Python, it's, it's, it's quite young. Um, it's a cousin of Java, in the sense that uh, Scala exec executable, they run on the Java virtual machines. So uh, th th this is by code. Um, uh, but however, like Java, uh, Scala contains from scratch many ideas from functional programming. And I don't know if you are uh, familiar with functional programming. Uh, so this is to oppose to uh, imperative programming, for example, the uh, model. Um, it's quite good if you have to manipulate a lot of data <laughs> because unlike pro uh, imperative programming model, you won't execute things directly. So you will just declare what you want to do and only at the, at the very end, you will trigger some computation, which hopefully uh, will be optimized by Spark. And we'll, we'll see that in detail at the very end. Of course, this is a very short description of functional programming, but I, I encourage you uh, to look at Scala. It's, it's a very nice language, uh, especially if, if you like, um, let's say, uh, mathematical, uh, well, mathematical ground for, for different languages. Okay, uh, so that was a uh, well, short introduction on, on, uh, on the context. Um, so this lecture will be split in three sessions. Uh, we are in the first session, um, there will be two others. The learning objectives of this first section, section is to first uh, dig a bit uh, one of the API of Spark called Spark SQL. And we'll see how to load and distribute the data with Spark. We'll explore uh, the data frame and um, how the partitioning of the data is done. So data frame sounds very familiar to you, I think, if you are using Pandas already. Um, well, uh, spoiler alert, it's quite similar. At least share uh, a lot of properties with those. And we'll see how to manipulate uh, Spark SQL built-in function. So how, how you can manipulate the data. But first, I said Spark is a framework uh, to do computation on uh, many machines. So we are really talking about distributed computing. So what does that mean? So here is a very brief sketch of, uh, of, of a cluster, let's say, uh, for doing uh, distributed computing. So on the left here, you have the driver. So the driver is basically uh, where the main program will be, will be launched. And then you have here workers. So the workers basically receive the task uh, to be performed. And they will do the computation. You can do many different things. And then they will reduce the results and send it back to the driver. So of course, this is complicated. This can be very complicated to operate in, in, in practice uh, because there can be many different workers. Uh, they can be distributed in different places. Physically speaking, uh, they can they can be heterogeneous. So this worker can be very different from this one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a big mess. So on top of that, usually what we use is a cluster manager. So cluster manager is is a software 
uh, that will help you basically to deal uh, with the hardware, the network configuration, how to handle uh, different uh, resources. And so this will be uh, your best ally uh, in dealing with all this mess. And on top of all of this, uh, you will work with typically a distributed storage system. So of course, each worker and the driver, they have local uh, storage system, but of course, the local storage system of this worker is not seen by this one, unless uh, you do it, but in general, uh, it is not. So if you want to work uh, with a lot of data and you want the worker to see this data, irrespective of where it stay, you need to have a distributed storage system that can basically uh, serve the different workers uh, on demand. So this is basic idea. This is the basic building blocks of your uh, cluster when you're doing distributed computing. So if you want to see that more in detail, up, let me switch to the blackboard. So you start with your driver. So you have the driver. This is where you will write your main program and launch it. Then on top, you have the cluster manager. So this is the cluster manager. And then you have workers that will do the computation for you. So you can have many, as many as you want. If you are enough rich, you can have thousands. If you are like me, uh, well, you have a bit less. So <clears throat> when a job starts, basically it starts with the driver. So you write a program and you launch this program and you say, now <clears throat> I would like to request some resources uh, in order to do my computation. So what you do first is you will contact the cluster manager. So this is the first step. The cluster manager will say, okay, uh, this user, in he or she needs, uh, I don't know, N machines uh, with uh, N gigabyte memory uh, in RAM, uh, and, uh, I don't know how many CPU uh, per uh, worker. So basically, because the cluster manager know, knows the topology of the, uh, of the cluster, it will then contact the worker and say, you, I need you, you, I need you, and you, I need you as well. Oh, this is the second phase. So if the workers are available, great, they will say, okay, I'm available for this computation. And then the worker will connect back to the driver uh, via SSH. So this is just SSH connection. So this is the third step. And then you're ready. Then you're ready, the driver can directly talk with the worker over SSH, and then the driver will send the task. So we'll see later, but the driver will first generate what's called the logical plane, then the physical plane, describing all the different tasks to do, and send that uh, to the worker. So this is the basic idea uh, of launching a job with Sparkle in general uh, in a distributed environment. Oops, wrong button. Okay, so how to run Spark application in practice? So when you install Spark, uh, basically uh, it gives you access to binaries. Uh, you will often see the Spark submit binary. So this is the one you will use to launch your application. So in Python, for example, you write a Python script uh, with Spark common inside. And what you will do is you will do Spark Summit. You can specify a bunch of options. You will, we will see together some of them during the lecture. Uh, you will specify your script and then a few options based uh, on the script. Very simple. So, and you do that on the driver directly. So this command is launched is launch from the driver. And then, as we said, the driver will connect to the cluster manager. So of course, when you do that, um, it's, uh, it's a common line, uh, well, it's a one-time job. So it, it will basically launch the job. You will have to wait, and then the job hopefully will finish at some point and we'll get back the prompt. But sometimes you would like to have a bit more of interactivity. So you will have to access a shell, for example, like a Python shell or a notebook. And you can do that in Spark. So you have another binary called PySpark. And you can launch it by specifying this option, this argument here, by saying, I would like to launch Spark, but this time just, oops, just launch a Python shell. And here in this case, it's an IPython shell, IPython interpreter. 
And what it will do is just, it will uh, uh, open uh, IPython shell, but with Spark uh, initialized inside, Spark objects initialized inside. So you will basically pilot all your workers from a shell that lives inside the driver. So that's very good because then you can interact um, uh, with, with, with your cluster in an interactive way. And you can do exactly the same uh, with Jupyter. And this is basically what I am using today. And this is what you will find in, uh, in the repository of the school uh, when you are using Docker. So inside the Docker, what we do is basically we launch PySpark with a Jupyter notebook driver. So this is a kernel, a Spark kernel behind that will allow you to have a notebook with all the Spark functionalities loaded inside. So <clears throat> Spark is big, so Spark is a framework, and inside there are four main libraries. Uh, the first one is called SQL and data frames, and this is the one we'll explore today. Uh, so this library basically lets you uh, loading data first. So that's, that's probably the first thing you want to do. And then uh, query this data uh, inside uh, Apache Spark programs. Either is, uh, uh, using SQL, SQL syntax, or uh, a familiar data frame API. So very much like Pandas. So if you know Pandas, you will see it's no, uh, no more difficult. Um, then there are three other libraries that unfortunately we won't cover today, uh, although they are very interesting. Uh, the second one is streaming and structured streaming. So this is like the, the first one, but the idea this time is you won't interact with static data, so data that, that uh, lives on, uh, on uh, disks, but with streaming data so that are coming as flux. So you listen, I know, to a socket or whatever, Kafka. And, and you want to process this data. And this is basically what is, uh, what is used in, um, in uh, I don't know, when, whenever you are um, using uh, Twitter or uh, LinkedIn or whatever big companies that are basically uh, Facebook uh, dealing with uh, flux data. So things that are coming regularly. So I know you're on a website, you click, you click, you click, you click. Those clicks are collected. Uh, basically by someone and send somewhere to be analyzed. And this someone and somewhere, basically you can be sure that in most of the cases it's Spark running behind uh, getting all those things. Uh, the third one is machine learning library. Uh, so this is probably a bit behind the others, although it contains many interesting features to do machine learning. And the last one is graphics. Uh, so this is a library to deal with uh, graph, uh, graph data, so graph database, etc. Uh, so quite interesting as well. But of course, all of them make sense when you have a lot of data, because of course there are many things to do streaming in life, many things to do machine learning, many things to do graph. Uh, Spark is not the only one, but here uh, the figures is you can do that at scale with a lot of data. Okay, uh, so as I said, we will mostly focus on the SQL uh, data frame today. And of course, the first thing you want to do when you're using Spark is to load data. Okay, you have a lot of data and you say, I want to read this data and I want to work with that data. Um, and this is the first thing you need to understand and you need to think of is what's my data source? So if we want to make a tour of data format in, in two minutes, so very briefly, uh, of course, you know that there are many data formats used in general, um, even many, also many in the context of big data. Uh, so I list uh, some of them, it's not exhaustive, uh, there are probably more than that, uh, but you will often uh, see CSV. So you know CSV is just basic text things. Uh, it's quite old, actually. The, the standard, the definition of the standard is 1978. You will uh, often hear uh, XML, JSON, Drift, Protobuf, uh, Avro, Apache Avro, Apache Parquet, uh, ORC. Um, there are many, many, many. And of course, I mean, 
every single project will use its own favorite data format and you cannot expect that everybody will use the same so you have to you have to think of uh, what what spark can read and can i do it um and for me for example in science uh, well <laughs> we don't use much those formats probably you will see sometimes csv where when people are lazy uh, or json um, now Parquet is, is, is getting uh, in, uh, in the game a lot, uh, at least in LSST, for example, in Robin. So uh, we use a lot of Parquet. Um, but this, these are not the main uh, data formats uh, that you will encounter. And often, often you will hear about FITS, so FITS formats, especially in astronomy. You will hear uh, about HDF5 or root and particle physics. And question is, can Spark read those? Can I use my FITS data? Can I use uh, my uh, 10,000 different root files uh, with Spark? This is the first question you should ask. Of course, no. <laughs> Spark cannot natively. Okay, so because the so Spark, even though it started as a, as a research project, uh, it was quickly driven by uh, industrial needs. So, uh, and in the industry, uh, oops, they, they don't use those. Okay, they don't use FITS, they don't use HDF5 much. Uh, they don't use root, uh, but they use CSV and they use Spark. So basically, all those, all those ones, they are supported by Spark natively. So you have to worry about connecting to a data. Those ones, no. So you have to think a bit more. Um, so of course, you could say, OK, well, Spark cannot read my data, so I will stop here and do something else uh, with my life. But no, you are a scientist, and, and of course, you, you love solving problems. So you will say, how can I read my, uh, my data uh, fits or root or HGF5 with Spark directly? And here you have two ways. Um, either the, the indirect way, I would say, and the native way. The indirect way here, you will say, well, actually my data fits or roots or HGF5 or whatever. Uh, it's just a convention, okay? In the end, what's what's behind is just like a blob of binary uh, with some convention on top that helps me to read the data. And if I know the convention, I can just load my data as a binary string and just decode it then on the fly within what I call executor, so within the machines directly of my network. Uh, and that's easy. That's easy because you don't have to worry about uh, about anything else because there exist uh, already decoders for those. The, with AstroPy, you can read feeds. Uh, there are things to, to read roots, etc. It's no more related to Spark. So Spark just read the binary uh, data and you handle decoding. So it's pretty easy to do and people started to do that in, uh, in our science community, but it leads to very poor performance. Okay, uh, For many reasons, uh, I won't enter the detail here. There are quite technical they are not difficult to understand but quite technical uh, but the bottom uh, bottom line is very poor performance so there is a second way to say well <coughs> actually when spark is reading uh, csv xml json whatever it uses a connector okay and so if i can mimic this connector but this time for fits or hd5 or root i've won uh, it's done i can read whatever i want so that's the idea that then most of us uh, did is to build a custom connector to access directly uh, those uh, data format natively. So of course, it's a bit more changing to write because you have to write it in Scala. Uh, and well, <laughs> we all love Python or C or whatever, but Scala is definitely not something we, we learn at school. Um, and so we have, to, we have to practice a bit before, but then it leads to excellent performance. So, of course, there are some people that have done the work for you. Uh, so there exists a native connector for feeds, HGF5 or roots. So you can use the, those in your favorite experiment. Uh, so in, for um, feeds, you have the two first. Uh, this one, which is basically an indirect way. So they, they, they read the data as binary and decode in the executor on the fly. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it works, but it, it, it doesn't have great performance. And you have this one, well, a disclaimer, I wrote it, so it's a bit of marketing. Um, but this one, which is a native connector for feeds data source, and it's used in LSST, it was used in the context of SKA, uh, it was used in the context of CTA, so 
it's already used and challenged. So that's great. And then you have one for HDF5. It's not the only one for HDF5, you have others. I just cite this one because I've used it. And for root, you have this one, uh, which is Spark root. Uh, so you can see the dates are a bit, whoops. A bit, uh, the dates are a bit old, although they are all working well. It's a connector, so in the end, it doesn't mean much uh, improvement over time, unless the data source API change. Okay, so now you know that you can uh, you can use uh, Spark with your favorite data format. Great, so let's move on. Um, so entry point of Spark. Uh, what's great with Spark is it comes, so when you, when you launch uh, either a Spark, uh, well, well, either a shell with Spark inside uh, or you launch a Spark job, uh, there are uh, objects uh, already instantiated for you uh, that basically uh, help you uh, dealing with, with all the commands. And the most uh, important one is called Spark by convention. Actually, it's an instant of Spark session. And this one, apply, yes. Um, this one, if you, uh, if you look at it, uh, basically it will give you brief information about uh, the Spark session you've launched. Uh, so here, for example, you are, we are using Spark version 3.1.1. Uh, we are using a local mode. So of course, I was talking about distributed computation, many machines, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Today, we will work mostly on the, with the local mode. So in the sense that I am using my laptop, so I don't have many machines at hand. However, I have many threads. So I will replace the machine by threads and everything will work the same. Just, I won't have big data, uh, but the idea is to, to explore the API. So, so here we are, we are using a local session and this is the name of my application. Well, that, that, that doesn't matter. Uh, and here is a link to the Spark user interface. Uh, I won't click it now, but we'll explore that later. So the Spark session, so this object, basically, oops, uh, will allow you to read data first. So that's very interesting. Uh, manage, manage the configuration of the cluster. Uh, so in case uh, it's not instantiated for any for some reason. You can also create it at any given moment. So you can do from PySpark.sql import Spark session. So of course, so of course, if you're completely lost, so PySpark is your entry point. And then if you, up, if you do a tab, uh, you will have access to all the different things from the notebook. Uh, so you have the context, uh, you have uh, MLlib, so that's the machine learning tool. Uh, one library, uh, you have SQL, so that's the, the library we are using now. You have, uh, well, you have many things. We'll see most of them, well, some of them over this, uh, this lecture. Okay, so, so first thing we want to do is to read data. So we know we have connector now, so we can read many different types of data. So let's, let's read some data. Um, so the interface to read data from disk is always the same for any kind of built-in and officially supported data format. So what's great is once you know a format is supported by Spark, then it's read the same way as any other format. So you have to worry about ah, how can I read this one? Uh, should I use a special library or blah, blah? No, no, it's always the same way. So what you do is we create a data frame by basically whoops, using this object Spark, uh, using the read method. So you do spark.read, and then you will specify the format of your data. So this is a string. So if I'm using CSV, I will uh, specify format uh, CSV. So directly here is up. the way you do it is CSV up, or whatever fits. Then you can specify a bunch of options uh, the same way as you would do in Pandas. For example, when you are uh, using, I don't know, read underscore CSV, then you have a bunch of options uh, to read the header, to read the, I don't know, to infer the type of the data. Uh, those are the well, very same options. And then you specify the path to the data. 
And alternatively, so you can use either this uh, syntax or you can specify directly. So there is, uh, uh, there is a shortcut, so you can use this wrapper. Uh, dot csv if you want to read csv there will be dot json dot parquet dot uh, whatever yeah, and you can specify you can inline directly uh, the pass and the options well it's just a matter of, of convention on what you prefer but they lead to the same results um, so yes format can be csv json parquet uh, the option as i said um, uh, they are here to, to specify a bit if the data is malformed or uh, if you want to specify on the header. In case you are completely lost, so each data format has its own set of options. In case you are lost, you can always uh, use the help. Okay, so in a Jupyter notebook, you can use the magic interrogation mark, question mark, uh, or you can use uh, simply uh, help, uh, help one, uh, that would give you uh, access to the help of this, uh, this method. Um, the path here here comes the problem well not the problem but you have to understand that you want to work in a distributed environment so obviously your data will, will not sit on the local disk of your driver okay especially if you have petabytes of data so the data will be stored typically in a distributed storage system um, the way it's stored is a bit different than what you are used to. Usually you are used to, I don't know, monolithic files, at least uh, it's, what, it's how you see them uh, on, your, on your disk, on your local disk. And here the distributed file system will basically take your file, initial data, chunk it, uh, and then uh, distribute the chunk there, 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 there. Uh, doesn't have to be, uh, let's say, um, uh, the, the two chunks, one after the other, doesn't have to sit on the same machine, for example. So it can be completely scattered uh, all over your distributed storage system. So you have to specify that to Spark, not how the things are split, but you have to specify which kind of distributed file system or which kind of file system you're using, distributed or not. And the way you would do it is uh, via URI. URI. Uh, so these are the three main uh, things you will encounter with Spark. HDFS, to start with. So HDFS is the Hadoop Distributed File System. So it belongs to the Hadoop ecosystem. So Hadoop, remember, I mentioned it uh, with the MapReduce programming model. So Hadoop uh, released also a version, I mean, its own version of, uh, of a distributed file system, storage system called the Hadoop Distributed File System, HDFS. Uh, it's quite nice. It has a very good performance and it's, it's uh, widely used. And the way you would access it is by specifying HDFS uh, colon slash 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 pass to your data. Uh, directly. You can connect also to F3. So this, if you work in the context of, I don't know, uh, Amazon uh, or uh, Ceph, for example, this file system, um, you would use this, uh, this implementation. Uh, so you will use S3, column, slash, slash, blah, blah, pass to data. Uh, here are object storage. So this is really not really a pass, it's pass to a bucket or whatever. It's a pointer. Um, or you can connect to local file system for test purposes, of course. You won't have big data file here. And this is what we we'll use today just because it's easier. Uh, and if, if you want to test Spark uh, or just do a quick development, quick test, uh, you can say, well, actually, Spark, please read a file on my local disk, and you will do files, colon, blah, blah, blah. Um, OK, so that's great. We know how to load data. That's great. Uh, one more thing is dependencies. So you're probably. Um, used to Python where you, you will, for example, if you need a dependency, I don't know, you need AstroPy or you need Pandas, uh, what you would do is you will install this dependency in your environment. Uh, so you do conda install, uh, you, know, you will create a virtual environment and then you will uh, do a conda install uh, whatever I want. So of course this installation will be on your machine locally and your process or your, your program will, uh, will directly see this dependency and be able to use it. However, we have a problem. We have here our driver where the main program is launched. 
And then you have workers. And the worker, they are physically distant from the driver. I mean, uh, what I install on the driver is not seen by the worker, obviously, because it's a totally different machine, uh, unless you have uh, know, uh, something like um, uh, CVMFS, uh, I mean, file systems that are mounted and see by, by all uh, those things where you install all your dependency. There is no reason that what you install on the driver is seen on the worker. So you have to understand that it's not enough to install dependency on the driver, but you need to have exactly the same environment on the worker. And there you have different ways of doing that. Either you connect to the worker and you launch the installation script that you launch on the driver. So you replicate manually, let's say, what's on the driver. That works, but obviously that doesn't scale. Uh, if you have two machines, that's okay. But if you have a thousand machines, you won't do thousand SSH with all installation, especially it's well, it's painful. Uh, or you will use uh, containers. So you will basically um, use Docker, Docker image. And this Docker image will be basically spawned in the driver, but also in the worker, so that everybody works on the same environment. And all of that will be managed by Kubernetes, for example. Okay, yes, probably you've heard about this, uh, this before. So Kubernetes is just a cluster manager. And that we deal with containers. Uh, or what you can do is to ship the dependency at the runtime. Uh, so either at the compilation, if you're using Scala, uh, so you can uh, embed all your dependency. But if you're using Python, what you would do is to say, well, actually, when I will launch my job, I will launch the program, the task to execute from the driver to the worker. But I will also include the dependency directly. When, uh, when I run my thing. And oh, then if I click on the wrong button. And this is what's written here. So what you would do is you would do Spark submit. So I, I want to submit the job. And you will also specify packages, for example. So these are dependency from uh, Maven. Uh, Maven is, is basically for uh, Java, uh, but kind of JVM thing. And there is the very same comment for a Python dependency. So you would do for Python, you would do uh, oops, minus minus pi files and the name of your dependency. So that can be either a zip or a ape or whatever. So you can go back to the packaging lecture you, you had last week. Uh, so you can package, you can make a Python, you can package a library, Python. Okay, library, sorry, and pass it directly on the command line. So really, really keep in mind that dependency uh, needs to be propagated to the workers, not only to the drivers, so it's not enough. So of course, today, in the context of our lectures, we are looking, we are using a local context. So everything that is, uh, everything is available, both from the driver and the worker, because they live on the same machine in our case, and workers are just threads uh, launched by the driver. Okay, let's move on more hands in. Let's load and distribute some data. Uh, so you will find uh, test data in the folder data in, the, in this uh, Spark folder of the school repository. Um, Probably before we move, very brief parenthesis. Sorry, it's a very long introduction, but I, I told you that uh, probably it's better first to take some time to describe it about this framework before um, getting hands on. So the main data object in Spark is the data frame. So I briefly mentioned it, data frame, data frame. It sounds similar to, it's familiar to you because of pandas, but it was not always the case in Spark. So Spark in 2009 and until version two of Spark, so 2016, the main object was called the RDD. So RDD stands for Resilient Distributed Dataset. Um, RDDs are distributed memory abstraction, they are flow tolerant, immutable, well, great properties when you're working with a, a distributed environment. Um, and then Spark switched to a data frame. So What's the difference and why did they switch? So let's make Spark version one and Spark version two and later. So version two and plus. 
So in version one, you had the RDD. So the RDD stands for uh, Resilient Distributed Dataset. What it was, it was basically a blob of data, binary data blob with some lineage. So you can reconstruct it if there is a failure, but in the end it was no more than a blob, binary blob. So uh, the network didn't have any insight about what contains the blob. It was you as a user that had to tell Spark what's inside. So you had to understand the schema of the data manually. You had to understand uh, many properties of the data before doing anything to the data. So of course that was inherited from, uh, uh, from Hadoop MapReduce and Google MapReduce. So that was not a surprise that Spark was using that, although it included more features, new features that wasn't there before, but still, uh, it has a lot of limitation, especially since Spark couldn't see inside the blob, it couldn't optimize the data movement or uh, the computation. And so starting from version two, uh, there is a, a new object called a data frame. So data, let me just call DF, data frame. Briefly speaking, and it is briefly speaking, a data frame is no more than an RDD plus a schema. So in the sense that you know once it, what's inside, so you know the types of the data, uh, and eventually the name, but the type is more important. So, sorry, I'm very slow. Schema plus, and this is the huge things, a, S, a SQL engine on top that can optimize your computation. So SQL engine. Engine. Uh, so you have still the RDD, which is still there under the hood actually. So we will see later that from the data frame, you can access uh, the, the, the RDD, the data in the RDD. But then you have a schema specifying, well, actually I have a, I don't know, a column of floats, column of int, column of string, column of whatever. And then you have also a SQL engine, SQL engine that will say, ah, oh, the user wants to do that. But actually it can be better if it does that. And that will lead to the same result, but in a faster way. So let's do that. And that's speed up and, and simplify the life of, 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 of the users. So this is what you need to keep in mind. RDD are not dead, they are still there, but they are enhanced. And they are called now data frame. Ah, click on the wrong button. Excellent. Let's load the data. So how do you load data Oops, in Spark? So uh, we've seen the syntax before, so it's very easy you do Spark, but we dot, um, we'll start with a simple CSV file. So format CSV and you specify the path to your data. So here I didn't specify, so I told you you should do five, blah, blah, blah. actually here Spark knows that I am using a local mode. So he knows that I will connect to the local file system. So I don't have to specify. It. So basically, um, this object data frame underscore csv underscore symbol uh, from, from this comment and what I want to do is to inspect his schema so I want to know what's inside the data so if I execute that so of course spark needs to wait wake up a bit the first comment is always known voilà. you see that so you see there is four columns in that data frame so data frame is a table you can see it as a table it has four columns uh, they are name those weird names underscore c not underscore c one blah 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 and they are all of type string. This is weird. I know my data and I know they are not named that way and they are not um, they are not strings. But that's expected because by default the CSV connector it doesn't try to understand the type of the data and doesn't try to infer the name. Okay. It will just say, okay, you ask me to load this data as a table, I load it, but I, I, I just stop my job here. So a small exercise, how would you infer the data type and use the first one as a column names? So it's very much like pandas. And you've done this exercise um, from the pandas text, right? Well, it's, it's, it's quite easy. So we had this line that leads to, to this weird uh, behavior. And now we will enhance it by specifying two options. 
we'll say actually, yeah, we'll read my CSV, but I want to take the first line as the header. So that, that will basically extract the name of the columns. So here then you have X, Y, Z, ID. And I want also to infer the schema. So what does Spark will do under the hood? It will take a row and it will uh, look at the, at the element of that row and try to infer the schema based on that. So of course, it knows basic types or let's say um, uh, primitives. Uh, if you have uh, something very complex, it will probably complain at some point. You will have to specify manually the schema. And if you do that, um, then you will print the schema and we say, Spark, please uh, print the schema. Then we went from this C node, C1, blah, blah, string, all strings to this X, Y, Z, ID, and the three, the X and Y and Z are doubles, and ID is an integer. Great. So we have a, a table with X, Y, Z, so positions, and some ID. Actually, if I plug this data, uh, well, if I, if I look at this data, so, whoops. So the way you would look at data is you would say, well, now I have my data frame and I want to see, for example, the 10 first elements. Well, first doesn't mean much in a distant environment, but give me 10 elements. Uh, so this is this, this show common. And so you see, we have a table, four columns, X, Y, Z, and ID, and we have these numbers with like the meaning of digits after the comma. And of course, you can specify uh, five if you want five on me. You can specify 100 if you want 100. Uh, so, so that's the way you would see. Uh, show is great because, so what we have done very basically, so we have the driver, we have workers, workers, and we had, we have our file system. So in our case, it was the local file system, but it can be a distributed file system. And we say, well, please driver, well, please worker, uh, load this data. So the worker will basically connect to the file system to see what data is, but it will not load the data. So actually when I said, when I say here, Spark read the data, it didn't really read. So you have to understand that under the hood, there is functional programming. And Spark basically uh, is using transformation and those transformations are lazy. They are not triggered unless there is an action at some point. So you have to, so this, these are concepts from functional programming. You have on the one hand transformations and on the other hand actions. Transformation, you would just declare what you would like to do to the data. So here in that case, my transformation is please, I would like to load the data at some point. And here, I could have terabytes of data. The cluster wouldn't move the data yet. It would say, okay, this user, he would like to load the data. But then I trigger an action. Show is an action. Show say, well, now I would like to show this data. Um, only when I say show, then the data flows. Oops, the data flows from. Ah, isn't that right? Okay, well, there will be no more row. So then it flows from the file system to the worker and then the worker to the driver. And of course, I specify not everything. I didn't say show me everything, otherwise I would kill my driver because imagine I have terabytes of data and I say show me everything. Show me everything means bring back everything to the driver and, and destroy everything because if you have terabytes, you would have to have terabytes of RAM in your driver to hold everything. So here I just say pick up 10 rows wherever you want, uh, and, and send it back to the driver such that I can see it. This is the idea. And this is the data we will work with. Uh, very, very simple. And, uh, we are not using big data here, but that's not the point in the sense that we want to explore the API. And as I said, everything you write is equivalent regarding regardless of the volume of data. So this data cluster that CSV could have been anything, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, petabytes, you would write the same way. Of course, you would need more machines in one case than the other, but the syntax is the same. So this is basically what's happening. 
Okay, CSV is great. Uh, no, actually, it's not great. Uh, CSV is, is not very optimized. And in real life, you want to use more uh, structured data format, more complex, that allows you to be more clever when you manipulate data. And Parquet is one, so Apache Parquet. Um, and in the case of Parquet, but that, that's not the only one, you can directly, for example, infer the schema and data types. So you don't have to specify it, uh, unlike in CSV. And Parquet, especially, is, is really, for example, optimized also for fast data access and small memory consumption. So it comes with some goodies. Uh, and you think of big data, probably uh, things like CSV. Well, it's great to start with, but uh, in the end, uh, I like probably to move to something. Uh, so he's here. Uh, here is how you would load data with Parquet. So you have Spark read format Parquet, and you load the Parquet. So again, uh, the data is available from this folder. And if I print this, the schema and I show five rows, I uh, would have exactly the same result as for the CSV one. So this is the same data, basically, that I just replicate. And X, Y, Z, I, D, and X, Y, Z. You can do that with fits as well. I, I told you that they are custom connectors. Uh, the only thing you would need is to make sure that whenever you launch your Spark, Spark application, either on a shell or just a job, regular job, you would have to specify the dependency on the fly. So you would say, uh, here, for example, I want to use this package called SparkBits uh, using this coordinate, this version of Scala. So this is Scala 2.12, and this is the version uh, of the library. And the syntax is always the same. Spark that read the format fits, blah, blah, blah. Here you have an option. So if you know uh, fits, you know that they are ordered uh, by HDU, uh, header data units. Uh, so here, for example, data I want to read is contained in the first HDU. So I will just specify text spark that I want to read the first HDU. So we load data, great, <coughs> but Actually, we did more than that. We load the data in a distributed environment. So actually, this data is not is probably not in a single place. It's probably partitioned. There's probably a bit of data there, a bit of data there on different machines, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in your system or in the run of your uh, workers if the data has been loaded physically. Um, as I said, a data frame can be viewed as a distributed table. Okay, and this table basically will be chunked in partitions. Yes, here I have. So, if we start on the on the left, uh, here is a view, a unified view of a table. So you have columns A, B, C, D, and you have rows. And this will be, I don't know, for example, a pandas data frame. Uh, what your distributed storage system? And then Spark will do is to say, well, actually, <clears throat> maybe this table is, is quite big and I cannot handle it at once. So we just chunk it. I just make splits. And these splits will be sent uh, wherever I want. Well, when I say I is the history sorry, system of, of Spark, uh, wherever it suits best, uh, so that I will minimize data movement afterwards. Uh, but then what you will end up is uh, you will end up with partition. partitions. And so you will have the first partition that will probably contain um, the six first rows, second partition, third partition, etc. By default, so a system will try to make partition with uh, the same size, same size partition, because it's easier uh, well, to manipulate uh, heterogeneous blocks. Uh, so in HGFS, for example, a typical block would be 128 megabytes. So if you have a data and a table which is uh, one gigabyte, it would split it into five chunks, five, six, five, six chunks of 128, six chunks of 128 megabytes, etc. etc. So that of course will be done for you as a user. You don't have to specify by hand how you will split your table and how the split will be done, etc. That, that would be a nightmare. Uh, though it can help if you understand how it works, you don't have to do it. So how so we know the data previously so how were distributed the different data frames so in other words how many partitions has each data frame you can access the number of partition 
by basically, so you take your object, your data frame. So here is the data frame from our CSV, for example, loading. Uh, what you will do is you will enter inside the data frame and you say, well, actually, <coughs> I will get back to my RGD. Remember those RGD that, that those objects that were present in version one, and now they are uh, hidden inside the data frame. So I will say, I have my data frame. Um, uh, I will enter my RDD and I will ask how many partitions I have. And I can do the same for the parquet and for the fixed data that I've loaded. And you can see the results. It's, ah, sorry, I forgot to. Execute. Cells. Um, and you can see they don't have the same number of partition. So the CSV file has only one partition, the parquet has two, and the fits has one. So the partition varies as a function of the initial data set. And here you will enter a complex thing called partition. Well, <clears throat> Um, I think the, the main principle behind Spark or MapReduce in general is that moving computation is usually cheaper than moving data, especially if you're working with big data. Okay. Uh, so if you are working with terabytes or petabytes, it's probably wiser if you send the computation where the data is rather than moving the data where the computation should happen. So Spark reads, uh, reads five blocks. Uh, and instead of copying five blocks, you know, uh, saying, I want this block, so I will take it, um, the driver instead will send the computation to worker nodes that are close to the data nodes. So basically, there is um, a discussion between your worker nodes, so the, the one that are doing the computation, and the data nodes to say, well, I would like to do this computation. Please, data nodes, tell me where the data is such that I can send the worker that is the closest to the data so that the data don't, doesn't have to move much on the network. So I don't know if you have a uh, topology of network in mind, but basically what you have is you have uh, machines that are on racks, and those racks are inside probably uh, bigger racks that are, on, uh, that are connected uh, via wires or, or Ethernet or whatever. Um, and then uh, those big racks uh, are inside the center and the center communicates with another center. So you have different layers. Of course, <laughs> the more you go inside those layers, the more travel you have to do with your data through cables, with things that are quite um, slow. So if you can do the computation very close to data, so that data doesn't have to move, move, move much, you win. Um, so the question is, how many partitions should I use? Is my default partitioning correct, et cetera, et cetera? So those are the typical questions uh, you will ask very quickly. Because by default, Spark will uh, infer some default number of partitions, but maybe you are not happy. Or maybe you say, well, that's different from what I had in mind. So how you will define the number of partitions, so how, how you will define uh, the optimal number of chunks uh, for your data. Well, you will practice <laughs> in practice based on those four things. So keep those in mind for later. Uh, first thing is the total volume of data you want to distribute. So it's not the same thing if you are working with petabytes or terabytes or uh, gigabytes, although you should not use Spark with gigabytes. Um, it will depend on the number of CPU or cores uh, you have access to and the RAM, the available RAM per CPU, of course. Uh, that will depend on the kind of file system you are using, distributed or not, and type of distributed storage system you are using, and the kind of task you want to perform. Is it something which is, uh, I don't know, CPU bound, uh, you need to perform a lot of things, or in the contrary, you don't have many operations. However, you have to duplicate a lot of data, for example, uh, during those steps. Uh, so you will need actually small partition to accommodate the fact that uh, inside the worker, the size of the data will grow because you will have to do copies, et cetera, et cetera. So, but you will, you will have to practice uh, depending on the context. Uh, there is no generic solution. 
Uh, however, there are rule of thumb uh, too. If you have too few partitions or if you have too many partitions, if you have too few, you will not take benefit from all the cores available in the cluster. Okay, so there will be a few cores working and the other just uh, doing nothing. Uh, so in the end, you could have been faster by using more cores. And the second one is if you have too many partitions. If you have too many, usually they are small and there will be excessive overhead in managing many small tasks. So you have to understand that for each task, uh, there is a discussion between the driver and the cluster manager, the cluster manager and the worker, the worker and the data nodes, the data nodes and the cluster manager, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's really like a very messy meeting of talkative people. Uh, so if you can reduce the communication between all those people, it's better. Especially that usually you are not using, uh, let's say, infinite, infinite band. Uh, so you have a community hardware, so machines, like not very well, a bit old uh, with just Ethernet cable. So uh, if you can optimize this communication, that's better. In Spark, you can repartition your data sets uh, in several ways. Uh, you can see how popular it is to repartition uh, different things. So you have your data frame, you can do, you can use the, the method repartition, for example, and specifying oops, the new number of partition you would like. So the new number of chunks you would like your data to be chunked. You can do repartition by range. So here is basically you have your data frame, which is a table. And you will say repartition my data frame, but this time make chunks according to a specific column. So imagine you have a column of IDs. And I don't know, you have columns with ID1, columns with ID2, etc. You would like to make partition with all the objects with ID1, a partition with all the objects with ID2, etc. etc. That's the way we would do it. You can do order by, which is a repartition, repartitioning and a sort. Actually, sorting in a distributed environment, it's not an easy task. I will let you think about that. Or you can do coalesce. Uh, coalesce is probably the best you can use, although because it doesn't shuffle the data. So that's the problem. So let me just spend one minute on that. So when you repartition, basically you start with, uh, I don't know, some partition. So you have a P0, partition zero, partition one. And what you will do is you will say, now I will repartition with uh, a new number of partition that can be the same or not actually, but the data basically will be sent to this new partition in a random way. So, so this is P0 prime. And this is P1 prime. And data from partition zero will end up in both P0 prime and P1 prime and the same for partition one. And those A rows, what do they mean? They mean that the data has to be shuffled in the network. And of course, the network is very slow because you have cables. Uh, so these are slow operations. You see, if you have to move terabytes of data over the network, uh, it would be very slow. And coalesce is a way of partitioning without moving the data because it will just merge partition together to create, uh, let's say, uber partition or just meta partition bigger uh, without moving the data. Okay, let me skip that. Uh, let's play a bit with our data. We have 15 minutes, now we'll be hands-on. Uh, so for that, we will focus on uh, the parquet data set. Okay, so we load the data inside this DF object. Well, actually, you know that I didn't load the data, so I declare that I would like to load the data. This is lazy or strict, strictly speaking. First thing you would like to do is <clears throat> to basically uh, do data mining. So imagine you have a data set and you don't know this data set. Uh, you would like to inspect a bit the data, do some select, do some filtering of the data based on some properties. And there are powerful methods in Spark to select subset of columns or to filter rows based, based on um, the value of elements. Uh, select and filters are transformations. So again, they are lazy. They won't trigger any data movement or computation in the cluster. So you can basically uh, play with it. You can, uh, you can do as many filters as you want. So for example, keeping, uh, remember our data frame was this table with four columns, X, Y, Z, and ID. So I can do well, actually, I would like to filter on only the columns with X uh, greater than one. So you would write just DF, use the filter method. And here you have uh, 
uh, uh, CQR uh, syntax or, or simple CQR syntax. You can use a different syntax uh, by uh, still using the filter method, but inside working with uh, columns directly. So when you do df brackets x, uh, basically you will uh, select the column x of the data frame. So actually, if I do that, oops, why? Ah, I forgot. Oops. But actually, if I trigger this one uh, and I look at the type of that one, so this is a column object, so this is Spark object uh, with name X. Um, and it didn't trigger anything on the cluster. However, it will uh, give you the return type. So you'll say, uh, actually, this filter, it didn't change the type. So you will still have a data frame with four columns. The cardinal uh, of the column is preserved. Uh, however, you will have less rows because you will select only rows for which the values of x is greater than 1. Oops. Uh, you can also filter on column names, so that, that's called a select. So you want to filter the select and you say, well, actually, I would like to have only the y column, for example. So you will do that. And if I do actually df y only, uh, so I select only y, you can see that this time, I have a data frame with only the column Y. However, all the rows, you can select several columns by specifying a list of them. And you would access them by using a string. So their name of the string. So very, very similar to pandas. No, nothing changed. It's, it's, uh, you can change transformation. So you can do a filter. And then a select, and you could have done uh, I don't know, 10,000 filter total and select. Uh, there is no problem in Spark. Uh, so this one will work. And finally, you can trigger an action to start actually the computation. So to do something on the cluster. So you can do now what I want to do is take my data frame, filter all the, the column, the, the rows that have a value of x greater than one, and count them. So how many of them there are. So actually, I can do that, and we we'll say there is 12, uh, well, uh, 1,291 entries with x greater than one. Actually, we could have done better. Uh, we could have do, we could have done print. entries. I could have done tf.count. Okay, so I have 4,000 total entries. So if I do just a row count of all the elements, uh, all the rows in my data frame, and I have only 1,291 entries results. Um, okay, so select, select and filter are great. Uh, we can go uh, a bit beyond. And there are many built-in functions in Spark and they are available in uh, this uh, module uh, by Spark SQL functions. Um, what I can do, for example, is I can select a column and do a computation directly on this. So I will say, I take my data frame and I will select all the initial columns. So this is the purpose of the star df columns. So df column is a list of, of elements. So let me show you. So df column is a list of names. So I will say now, uh, select me all those columns. And in addition, so I have a comma here, in addition, uh, create a new columns for which you will do what? You will compute the radius. So radius is just like the, 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 the distance. So I take the x column square, I add it the y column square, I add the z column square, and I take the square root of that. That's typically the norm. And if I execute that, I have indeed the four initial columns, and I have a new column oops, here called what I did, that I did called radius. So I need to use the alias, otherwise it gives like the name of the, the, the operation you did, which is quite unreadable. So I name it radius, and here is basically the result of this operation. So it does that LM, uh, row by row. Okay. 
if if so there are many 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 built in comments so if you bring the help of this f so f is just the alias for uh, SQL functions and if i bring the help of that you will have uh, infinite basically number of methods that you can use any kind of mathematical functions any kind of transformation uh, so for example extract the hours of a given date as integer they can do many many things you can group things uh, you can do greatest so give me the greatest values of the list of I mean, there are literally hundreds of things that you can do already they are built in they are optimized they are super fast so whenever you want to do something with spark have a look at this one there are probably something the random number generator uh, can be useful because random number generator in a discrete environment, trust me, can be a nightmare. You can do some statistics as well. So imagine you are digging inside your data, you don't know what it is. Uh, first thing you want to do is probably, I don't know, doing some statistics like what's the mean of my data, what's the standard deviation, what's the minimum, the maximum. Spark can, can do it in, in one line. Uh, so you take your data frame, you say, describe me this data frame, and then show it as, like, as a data frame. And so here you have the statistics column by column. So that's cool. Uh, you can aggregate data as well. Uh, so what mean aggregation? Aggregation is uh, Basically, you will say, uh, I don't know, now I would like to do computation, but computation based on some uh, grouping before, in the sense that in my previous example, I have X, Y, and Z and ID. So I would like, for, for example, to group object by their ID value. And then for uh, the object with the same ID, I would like to do some computation. So you know, you group before doing something. So of course, that implies some shuffle before. And the way you would do that in Spark is by using those methods called group by or order by. Or whatever they are uh, so for example, we would like to group by ID and then count the number of elements per ID. And in Spark, that would be take my data frame, group by the ID values, we call them ID, and then count and show it as a data frame. And you see there are three unique IDs, zero, one, and two. And they uh, contain each roughly the same number of elements, uh, 1,300. It's a quite well balanced data set. Uh, so, for example, you can then chain the things to do some computation. So, I could group by and then aggregate the data to compute the very center of each uh, cluster uh, of ID. What I would do is I group by my data by ID. So I form this cluster of, data, of ID. And then for each cluster, what I do is I compute the mean of X, the mean of Y, and the mean of Z. And in the end, I have this data frame that shows me uh, average of X, average of Y, and average of Z. Um, in the last five minutes, Probably one of the most important things: uh, logical plan and physical plan. So I briefly mentioned that there are transformations, there are actions, uh, and I also briefly mentioned that the bottleneck in doing distributed computation is the human. So the brain of the programmer is is typically uh, very limited uh, in, uh, in trying to optimize things in a distributed environment. So Spark, well, Spark, the people behind Spark. Um, uh, understood that and they say, well, <clears throat> probably we will not let uh, the developer do, 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 uh, to do some things, to, to do the things on that. And we try to optimize directly at the level uh, of the software. Um, we try to optimize uh, the computation and the actions. So before running any actions, Spark will build yes, typo, the graph of the common that we call direct acyclic graphs. Uh, there are several. One is the logical plan. What basically you wrote as a developer. So it could just be a translation of, uh, of your program. Nothing changed, just, uh, okay, the, the, the programmer wants to load the data, wants to filter, wants to select, okay, no problem. And the other one is the physical plan. 
So what will be run actually on the cluster? Um, often the physical plan and the logical plan will be different because Spark will do some magic for you because you say, well, actually, yeah, well, it's great what you wrote, but uh, if, if I do that way, I have the same results, but actually I go way more faster. So in order to understand, let's look at two commands and outputs and let's notice the magic. So this is the first common. What I do is I have a data frame. So basically I ask to load, uh, well, I said I would like to load some data and I store this inside this data frame. Then I use the filter method. So I say I would like uh, the ID greater and equal than one. Then I would like to group by ID. And then I would like to count. I, well, it's completely meaningless. It's just for uh, purpose of the example. Uh, but anyway, because I don't need to group by ID if I keep it. Well, ah, okay. It's quite a lot. Okay, so I have a filter and I have a group by. So the first thing Spark would generate is a logical plan, so which is a translation of what you wrote. So there is no alteration. So first is you will read some parquet data. Then you will filter the data. And then you will aggregate the group by. Until that, everything fine. Uh, there is the analyze and the optimize. You don't need to worry about that. And there is the physical plan. Then. So what will be run? What will be run? Spark will indeed read Parquet file. Great. Then it will filter the data. Excellent. It follows what we wrote. And then finally, it will uh, do a reshuffling of the data for the grouping, and it will do a hash partition. It will use a hash partition. Great, Spark is great. He exactly follow what we did. So we are probably very clever. We managed to, uh, to, to understand uh, what Spark uh, needs. Great. Now let's look at this comment, which is exactly the same. However, this time I switch, I swap the group by and the filter. Okay. So the result is exactly the same. But this time I say, well, I would like first to group by and then filter. If I look at the logical plan, great. So what, what he said is you will uh, read parquet, you will aggregate, excellent, and then you will filter. So it's exactly what we want. And if we look at the physical plan, Spark say, okay, the, the user, uh, we will need to uh, read parquet file. And then he say, we will first filter. He didn't say we'll group by, he said, no, 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 no. let's filter, because then we'll move a lot of data. And that would be easier then to group by things because there will be less data to shuffle over the network. And so Spark for you, swap the two commands because he find an opportunity to optimize the data need. So always, always, that's a very good uh, habit to take. Always look at uh, the plans, the logical and the physical plans. Uh, see what Spark is doing, trying to optimize. Sometimes you wouldn't be able to optimize. I mean, it's not completely magic. So it's not good, okay? Um, but in most of, in some cases, that would be very useful. And that will also help you understand what you are doing in detail. Sometimes you will realize also that you are doing unnecessary things. Uh, your code will be cleaner. Um, so for example, uh, we can make an application in the last minute remaining, uh, repartitioning. So, Imagine I have a data frame and I want to repartition it. As I said, there are many ways of repartitioning the, the data set. So uh, let's, let's time two repartitioning method, repartition and coalesce. So just for the sake of this exercise, this exercise, I first repartition the data set into many partitions. I cache it in the memory of my uh, workers. And then I do a time it uh, on these two methods. One is to repartition into two, and the other one is to coalesce into two. And one is way faster than the other. Coalesce basically runs two times faster than the other. So what happened? What happened if I look at the, at the plan, uh, the physical plan, both they read the data. But in one case, there is a shuffling in the, in the network uh, using this round robin partitioning. And the other one, it's not a shuffling. It's an operation called coalesce. But there is no data movement over the network. No complex data movement. And this is the penalty, basically, uh, here, at least this, uh, this 200 uh, millisecond bound instead of 
three times less. So also looking at the plan helps you to understand the performance of uh, your application. Okay. Um, oh, okay. So have one more minute. I forgot that. Back to the driver. Uh, of course, everything we've done lives on the executor. At some point, you want to get back the data to your driver. There are many ways of doing that. Either you can say take, so take me 10 elements from the network, or collect. Well, collect <laughs> is a danger because it will collect all the data. So if you are manipulating terabytes, it will collect terabytes and your driver is dead. Or you can do two pandas. So it's very easy to take a Spark data frame and convert it into a pandas data frame and do then what you want, whatever you want. But again, you have to make sure to reduce the data before, otherwise you kill everything. Okay, um, we stop here for today, uh, for today, for this session, and we resume in half an hour, I think, uh, for the seventh session, which will go a bit more deeper into uh, science cases. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Julien. I think we're just on time, but maybe we will try to to ask uh, to to answer some some questions, some very quick questions, of course. Yeah. Uh, but one from Max, uh, for example, is it possible to use um, Spark uh, with uh, Slurm or HT Condor or other task manager? Uh, um, it's Yes and no. Uh, so I've heard some attempt to do that, especially at CERN. At the CERN, uh, so CERN is the, those are batch managers basically. Uh, so I think you can use that to submit uh, your Spark application. Yes, but it won't deal with the resources inside. So what you would do is you submit a Spark job via your batch manager, but then what you would do is you spawn a standalone cluster inside. And you will have to manually deal with the resource uh, that are inside. So I've done that also with uh, with, uh, with Serum at NERSC on supercomputer. Uh, I would say it's possible, but I think by you. Okay. And uh, for example, yeah, you you, you mentioned uh, also a way to to debug and to profile. Uh, because of course you start to with uh, with IPython to to interact with the workers and you use DAC to debug? Is there other way to, to debug? Yes, very good question. And we'll see uh, at least two other ways in the second session. Okay, yeah. so it's a trailer. Okay, yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, is it possible to profile, for example, with um, other software like um, Insight or NVProf? Cluster, um, yeah. mm -hmm. cluster profiler? Yes and no. Uh, so you have you have to keep in mind that here you are in a distributed environment. So it's so first of all, it's it's not on a single thread or even multi thread, but multi machines, and those machines are separated. So probably you can adapt those tools, and there are tools also to profile Spark. Uh, but probably it won't, the, the traditional tools that uh, you've seen during the lectures they won't be usable as is probably in a distributed environment. Uh, you would have to because the, the only thing you well the thing you need to do is first uh, to send the process on the different machine and monitor the process and then uh, get back the results combined in a meaningful way. So it's not impossible, but there are some work probably to to do. Uh, but Spark Spark has its own way of uh, dealing with that. Uh, you can you can define some metrics and do some profiling uh, on the at, at the runtime directly. Uh, I won't cover that. Uh, however, I can send um, reference on that. How to profile and instrument your Spark job such that you, you can uh, you know the memory and the and the run consumption. Okay, nice. And uh, is it okay if um, if there is a worker but in a very heterogeneous um, infrastructure, like we have GPUs, CPUs, but different kind of GPUs and different kind of CPU, many, maybe NUMA nodes or things like that. How does it handle the heterogeneousness of the, of the machine? So, so Spark, and in fact, this is not really Spark, but the cluster manager can deal with this heterogeneity indeed. Uh, so you can specify uh, what are the ones with GPUs, what are the ones with CPUs, uh, Mentioned new nodes and different type of nodes. Um, 
So the cluster manager, if it has information on that, it can use this, it can use, for example, uh, sorry, it can use this information to optimize then the task uh, assignment based on what you need to do. However, in practice, uh, it's better if you can seek for homogeneity uh, because it's not always possible to do some meaningful optimization. Uh, you really end up sometimes with, uh, I don't know, a few machines uh, doing things and the other just a bit behind because they, they cannot cope with, uh, with, the, with the thing. Of course, there are cues and um, clever ways of dealing with that. Um, so I would say general rule is if you can have homogeneous resources, distribution of resources, better. But Spark can deal, well, the cluster manager can deal with, uh, with this heterogeneity uh, eventually. Okay, and um, speaking of regional heterogeneity, is it possible to have uh, multi-threaded workers or tasks? Sorry, I didn't get the, the question. Is it possible to have uh, multi-threaded uh, tasks on, uh, yes. on Spark? We will see that probably uh, in the second session. But so uh, what you do is you will uh, launch a task inside the worker, uh, but then this worker uh, can perform a computation which is multi-threaded, uh, assuming you have enough uh, resources. But uh, yes, and especially for example, you can use pandas or numpies or numba things, uh, whatever. Uh, all the trick you are used to do, uh, you can use them inside the executor, inside the workers. Okay. Um... You spoke also about the, the problem if we if if you deal with two more tasks and uh, you overwhelm the you the, the task scheduler, um, is it uh, possible with um, uh, Spark Four? Uh, they announced last year that Spark Four can uh, schedule jobs on GPU to increase the memory and to have a better. Uh, uh, efficiency on on that. Uh, did you play with that or? So Spark Four is is not yet available at least and has been released. Uh, so we are we are Spark Three. Uh, I don't know if there is any Spark Four version. Uh, something I'm not aware. So for me, Spark Three is already a big deal to to move everything. Uh, now launching job on GPUs. Yes, it's um, it's something of course of interest, especially if you are doing machine learning. Um, so it wasn't possible until uh, very uh, recently. Uh, I think NVIDIA did a lot of work on that uh, to make sure that we can use Spark on GPU in an efficient way. Of course, there were, there were some hacks uh, and you could use Spark with GPU, but that was not native or that was not very efficient. Uh, now I'm not really a user of GPU, so I cannot really tell uh, what will be available, what is available, and what will be available now, and what will be the performance. I mean. Okay, so uh, we will finish with just two more questions, just really quick, uh, quick, quick ones. Um, you, you, you told that we, we can use Spark with um, Flux or Streams, uh, so of course we we need uh, to to use a software to to plug the stream into spark so could could you point some some of them or maybe it's another trailer for this afternoon or for for the next well, session but... it's not a trailer but thank you for that because i didn't have time to to mention it so actually uh, so you don't need any other software what you need is so reading a flux is just reading a new data source like reading a feeds or, uh, or CSV or whatever, just the data come as a flux. So what you need is a connector, exactly the same connector as uh, the other data source. And um, so you need connector for, uh, for flux uh, format. And for that, for example, uh, and I'm working on that, so, so that's great as you mentioned it, but uh, so things that can send flux and are widely used is Kafka, for example, Apache Kafka that would send flux. And the flux uh, data inside will be stored as AVO. So you will have a Spark Kafka connector that will decode uh, the, the stream, the binary stream as AVO uh, when it comes. So bottom line, the only thing you need is a new connector, no other software. And there are many connectors to read flux. Okay, and the, the very last one, because we, we need a break also. <laughs> uh, so about the API for, from Thomas, um, the, the API from um, Spark and from Pandas are very similar. And so which one did get inspired by the other one? Good question. 
Good question. Um, okay, that, that's my opinion. I, I, I'm not in the mind of the develop, of Spark developers, so, so I can speak for them, but in my opinion, so Pandas were there before uh, the, the Spark data frame came. So probably the Spark data frame was somehow inspired by Pandas. And Pandas moreover was, was popular at that time. So it was around 2016 that that, that was released. So probably the work began a bit before, but uh, Pandas was there for, for some time. Uh, however, the concept of data frame was there for a long time. Uh, it was called before N-tubes, uh, N-tuples or whatever. So the concept of data frame is not even uh, for Pandas. So Pandas stole it from somewhere, someone else. So I would say the fact that it used data frame is an old concept. However, the fact that the API is very close to Pandas is probably Spark that, that not copy, but uh, get inspired by Pandas. I would like to mention that, um, uh, so it's easy to go from Spark to Pandas. So you have a data frame Spark and you say to Panda. And um, now there is a work called Koala. I don't invent the name, uh, Koalas, that makes easy the other way. So going from Pandas to Spark. Um, you can check it out. It's, uh, it's not inside Spark, but it's de developed by Spark developers. So they have tight connection. And you can now do whatever Panda Spark go from one word to another in a, in a very smooth way. So check it out, Koalas, Koalas. OK, so thanks a lot, uh, Julien. So we will take a break mm -hmm. until 11, 11, and we will start again uh, Thank you very much. For, for Spark 2, the second <laughs> session on Spark. Thank you very much. See you in a minute. See you.